Welcome back to Taronga TV everyone. I'm in food prep and this is an amazing place in the zoo that you probably never get a chance to see. And I'm with Michelle Shaw and her team. She is our wildlife nutritionist at the zoo. Michelle, welcome to Taronga TV and thanks for having us in your kitchen. Thanks Hayden, it's nice to, that you came. It's just incredible, the amount of food here and this happens every single morning. Every single morning, so 365 days a year we're preparing food for the animals at Taronga Zoo in Sydney. What time do you start? 6 a.m. before the sun comes up most yeah, days right. and, uh, and and they're in here until at least two in the afternoon during the recent times they've actually been working longer hours to get all the food prepped for the animals um, but uh, yeah it's a it's a long day and a very busy day. So some food gets prepared uh, for each individual, but other food goes down to the section and then they do finer work, is that correct? Yes, that's right. So some areas like uh, Backyard to Bush or the Institute, they have kitchens there with, where they will still do the fine prep mm -hmm. for the animals there. So we will do a bulk pack for them. So we'll give them the amount that they need every day to, to prepare their diets. And other things like the Nocturnal House, they'll, we are actually weighing out all the pellets that they use, all the frozen vegetables and cutting up the fruits and vegetables and things directly for those animals yeah. so that it's the right yeah. size and shape for their yeah, little right. mouths. Now I'm looking at food here and yes. look this is magnificent. Rhubarb. Yeah. This is all human grade quality like for human consumption. Absolutely correct? yeah we get, it, we get it all for um, human consumption and, uh, and obviously we have to prep this when it comes in too because rhubarb in case you don't know rhubarb leaves are toxic. Top tip from the food prep team, don't eat the rhubarb leaves. So we have to cut those off and prepare them before we um, before we feed them to the animals, and because uh, the chimps don't know that. Yeah, you right. Know? So we have to make sure that we prepare it and it's safe for them. Yep. And we do a lot of prep that um, is preparing it so that it's safe for the animals. So for the giraffes, for example, we might cut it so that it's not too big for them to to choke on. Because giraffes, even though they have very big necks, yep. they actually have. They, they, they would choke on things that are too large for them. Mm -hmm. And we have a new little giraffe. Yes, secret. we do. It's a top secret. <laughs> top secret. Not now, it's out. <laughs> Sorry, exactly. That's Sorry all right. about that. We but reveal secrets here yeah, on Taronga TV. Should. I think we should, because I have no filter. That's good. So, yeah. so this small little giraffe, we have to cut things even smaller for, for this giraffe to a five cent piece to make sure that he doesn't choke on it, ah, for example. And then him. other animals like elephants, we have to make sure that it doesn't roll too much so that when keepers are training the elephants, they can throw it and the food doesn't roll away so that they lose interest. <laughs> That's incredible, isn't it? All these yeah. tiny little things that you would never know, interesting things that happen up in our food prep department. Now, I was going to ask you some numbers. Okay. And they're pretty, pretty incredible. The numbers, yeah. the amount of food that comes through this facility at Taronga is quite incredible. Hit me yeah. with some amazing numbers. Okay, I'm gonna hit you with some numbers. First, I'm going to hit you with the big number. It costs $1.7 million to feed all the animals at Taronga Zoo and Taronga Western Plains Zoo every year. Each year? Each year. And it's getting closer to $1.8 million this year because of all the trouble we've been having with the droughts and the bushfires and the uh, pandemic. So did the drought and the bushfire and the pandemic mm. impact prices or supply chains or, or what? everything. So the droughts that we've been having for the last decade have already, we're already affecting the, the availability of hay, for example, and grains and the prices of produce. You know, we, we have drought and then we have these floods and, and it all affects a lot of the, the produce that we get. Um, with the cumulative effects of the bushfires um, and then the pandemic on top of that, it's not only food availability and food price, but also supply chains. Yeah. So, you know, so we're having, um, we're having trouble getting food from uh, other states, for example, or from, from yeah, overseas. Right. You know, for some specialty products, we, we can't get some of the supplements that we would normally get. And all of those things have impacted price considerably. So we've had, uh, for our elephants, elephant diet, for example, is probably the best illustration of that. It's gone up 40% since the beginning of the year. So just our, our elephants that are at uh, Western Plains Zoo in Dubbo, they cost $14,000 last month just to feed the elephants at wow. that zoo. And they were $10,000 at the beginning of the year. Wow. That's, that's a really big yeah. price rise, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. But they, they're worth it. Oh, 100%. 100%. <laughs> yeah. But one of the things a lot of people come to see is the tigers. Mm -hmm. And our tigers 
con or actually we spend um, every every week we spend one day preparing their meals. Yeah. And it's 130 kilograms of meat a week just for our tigers alone. Sorry, I used to be able to do sums quickly. We're supposed to be able to do that in okay. our heads, aren't we? 130. <laughs> Yeah. times 52 yep. equals my goodness divided by 1000 equals just under seven tons of meat a year just for the tigers is it that much <laughs> my goodness that's, that, a, that's, that's right surprising. isn't it no it's right can you guys do that it's at right. home please and check that my maths is correct it's, no or my it's right sweet. it's sometimes just it even astounds me <laughs> Yeah, it's a lot of meat My goodness. coming in. And we have two butchers on staff, so they prepare all of that meat for the animals. And uh, and then we have uh, nutrition officers that are here every day to cut up the fruits and vegetables and, and make a kidna mix and, and uh, roll red panda bars. Whatever needs to be done gets done up here for the animals every day. Incredible. Mm. So nutrition, when I was a keeper, this was still here, um, but we didn't have a, a full-time nutritionist on board, that's for yeah. sure. The guys did the best job they they could, um, yep. but a full-time nutritionist, there couldn't be many of those in the world. Not too many. So there are about 30 zoos um, in the world that have a full-time nutritionist on staff. 90% of those are in the United States. Mm -hmm. The first zoo to ever have a nutritionist was only in 1974. So it's not very old, this this field. <laughs> He's not yeah. very old. And, um, and I trained under some of the nutritionists at that zoo. So I'm kind of what I consider like second generation nutritionist and that I trained over the, um, from the first nutritionists, and now I'm kind of trying to help train the next, the next generation of nutritionists as well. For people watching, would you be able to explain? Did you go into just general human nutrition, or did you go in specifically into animal nutrition? Because I think that's a really amazing field for people that yep. are watching that might be interested. Yeah, I think, and it depends on the nutritionist. So we all seem to have different journeys to get here mm -hmm. because there are so few of us. Um, there's there's not a lot of people that plan to become a zoo nutritionist, for example. So when I started, I thought I was going to be a veterinarian. I thought, oh. I want to work with animals, I like conservation. I didn't know about all the different opportunities for me. And in my first year of university, I met someone who was a wildlife nutritionist mm -hmm. and he kind of mentored me. And so I did work with Toronto Zoo in Canada and I learned more about it. And so I trained at an agricultural university. I learned all about horses, pigs, chickens, you know, all the production animals, cats and dogs and rats and those sort of things. Yeah. And then um, I, use all of that information to design the diets for our exotic animals. So I'm, I'm what you call a comparative animal nutritionist. So I compare our elephants to horses because we know a lot about those animals and so we can use that as like the baseline mm -hmm. for nutrient requirements and then kind of either scale it up or perform research to find out more about them. Incredible, absolutely incredible. So if you want to be a zoo nutritionist, here's your mentor, here's your spirit guide, in, in, and we're in her kitchen at the moment, and you can hear all the noise going on. The team's cutting up amazing amounts of food at the moment, so I just want to reference that because there's lots of chopping and things going around. Because they're noisy, you want me to tell them to stop? No, I love the noise. It's, it's food being prepared for animals, yes. which is nothing better, that's for sure. No, it's Now, better. if I was to drill down onto some real detail, yep. there's some really tricky animals to look after and they'd be really sort of specific animals that have yeah. that have maybe just um, exploited one food source for example uh, koalas mm. talk to us about how much or what it takes to feed a koala uh, well because that, we that doesn't happen here no, that, doesn't happen here. Yeah. that doesn't happen here that's more of uh, for our horticulture horticulture team mm -hmm. and uh, and they get all of the eucalyptus from our plantations for for our koalas and for one koala it uh, takes a thousand trees a thousand eucalyptus trees to feed one koala for a year so oh we have goodness. over 20 koalas wow that's 20,000 trees wow. I didn't even need a calculator you can do the numbers that. on that one <laughs> I don't need to bring my calculator out either I'm gonna we're good hey? we're getting do, better we're getting better yeah. wow and something like uh, an echidna yes now quite specific in its food and its diet in the mm -hmm. wild mainly invertebrate termites and ants and yep. and things like that at least that's what we think right so I mean a lot of the animals and the reason we're always doing research is because 
we have an idea of what the animals eat, but we don't. We really don't get the full picture. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of animals that might be eating insects, for example, like echidnas, but their sticky tongues are also taking in all of that termite mound, and there's a lot of wood fiber that they're actually ingesting as well. And even though they may be going after the termites, their bodies are actually using the termite mound as well as mm. part of their nutrient, you know, now, package. How did you find that out? Oh, I mean, people are going to be way. sitting at home going. How did you just wake up the one morning and go, hang on, yeah, was, what, how, just how did you work that, that out? <laughs> Well, that, that's the thing is, is that every diet that we have in a zoo is a research diet. We, we're always learning new things about these animals and we're trying to find the best animal model for them. So the production animals like I talked about, you know, I want to find the, the best animal model that works for our zoo species. And for years we used cats and dogs as our animal model for echidnas because they're insectivores and an in insect is like meat or so mm. we assumed. And so we would assume that they're they would require the same nutrients as a cat or a dog. And their digestive system inside kind of looked like that. You know, they had a simple stomach mm -hmm. and a very long intestine, and it was very simple, and, mm -hmm. and that's kind of what cats and dogs are like. But we found that there were a lot of health issues for echidnas in zoos, and they were getting gastritis, so their stomachs were becoming inflamed, kind of like ulcers. And that usually happens in animals like cows, for example. So they have these big rumens, and their rumens are not very acidic, it's very basic. And so if you add an acid to that, then it can cause burning kind of of the lining. Right. And, uh, and that's what we were seeing in the echidnas. So realize that their stomachs may look, you know, from the outside, they may seem like a cat or a dog, but when you get right down into the tissues of that stomach and the environment of that stomach, it's much more like a cow. And so they're digesting some of that fiber that they're taking in. And so we have to design diets based on what their nutrient requirements are and not what we um, used to think they were in the past. Incredible. So that's what we And how you we came did it. up with a specific diet for echidnas that's yes. used around the world. Yeah, it is being sold um, around the world now in, in uh, different places <laughs> where echidnas are being held. And we've had some pretty good be breeding success. We have amazing keepers here and amazing facilities, so they have everything working together to be able to, um, to really have good reproductive success. And I like to think the diet plays a little part in that as well. Oh, I'm sure it does. Um. Incredible stuff. <laughs> We could stand, I think we're going to do part two back here, that's for sure, because this is an absolute smorgasbord, uh, if you like that, of that stories in here. But another little fantastic sort of piece behind the scenes that you'd never see, Taronga TV loves bringing you things like this, so thank you so much, Michelle. Could we come back and have another look around at something else one day? Yeah, please do. Thank you so much. You never know what's around the next corner on Taronga TV. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Michelle.